Hello, and welcome to Those Forking Fangirls, where we talk all things nerdy book, TV, movie, pop culture, fandoms, and how they integrate into our adult lives. I'm Natasha. And I'm Christine. <laughs> uh, and sorry, it says I'm Christine it online. It says I'm um, Christine on the script here. <laughs> for I saw that. Okay, so today we're going to be discussing the journey, the experience of publishing on BookTube, which was prompted from one of our patrons, and her name is Caitlin. So thank you so much, Caitlin. Yeah, I, we're excited to dig into that today. To help us dig into the BookTube publishing whole experience today we have special guest author and friend sasha alsberg sasha can you give us a little bio of who you are for anyone who might not know you catch us up on you what you do your favorite fandoms what's going on with you yes of course so i'm sasha alsberg i am the co-author of the andrama saga and also the sole author of the breaking time duology um i started writing by accident when I was a freshman in college. And I never expected that to happen, mainly because I never saw myself as a writer, but only as a reader. But I started um, talking about books online back in, I forget the year, but it's been over 10 years. And it's been truly an incredible experience from going from a girl who never thought she could write because she was dyslexic and had ADD, but loved to read, um, to now being a published author of four novels. And it's all due to BookTube. I would not have been where I am today without that. Mm -hmm. And now I am living in London with my doggo Fiona, and uh, I work at Jaffe Books, a independent book publisher, and I'm living my best bookish dream, which also means that I get to go and live out my fandoms. So my fandoms are Outlander, of course, <laughs> which was a huge inspiration for Breaking Time. Um, and whenever somebody calls Breaking Time an Outlander ripoff, I'm so honored <laughs> because I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I was aiming for. And also, when it comes to the fact that, like, you know, I got my start on BookTube because of the Mortal Instruments series by Cassandra Clare, I have to say that that is my ultimate fandom of all time. Yes. And I'm forever grateful for it, for giving me the start and also damaging my hair because I love Clary <laughs> Frey and I always wanted red hair because of her. And I'm still sticking to it to this day. So thank you for the hair damage. <laughs> Ooh. But yeah, no, I love fandoms love and that's how hair. all three of us met, which was amazing. <laughs> she's had many shades of red hair through the yeah. years is that, is that is that a good bio yes yeah. it was a great bio was incredible. You, did you guys have seen like the ins and outs job there and yeah so who if you can't see sasha Thank has you. like perfect clary red hair at the moment too <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, back in the day sasha used to do a lot of like clary cosplay as the movie was coming out because she had like she looks a like striking me. resemblance to lily collins and she, you did like the eyebrows just like lily oh, it yeah. was fantastic i did the eyebrows <laughs> <laughs> were they fantastic though or were they a they mistake were. no it was the the time was eyebrows it was a time of eyebrows <laughs> And you nailed it. And you it. know what? We don't look back. We just go forward. <laughs> I mean, we look back and we appreciate the eyebrows. <laughs> right? I feel like when I look back, I'm just like, I wish I used like feather brows instead. <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't I know. think it was fun. I think it was a good time. So I don't think we should regret it. I think we should look back, laugh, or just feel like that was a fun era. Um, of course. But, okay, before we get into our main discussion today, we are going to roll into Snap, Crackle, Pop Culture News. We've got some stuff mm -hmm. to talk about today. I'm going to start it off with some Taylor Swift news. Today in Taylor Swift, we've learned that Taylor Swift has declined the Super Bowl halftime show now for oh, nine yeah. consecutive years. Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, so that's like Taylor firstly doesn't need the Super Bowl, but also a lot of people have speculated for a long time that she was a rep for Coke and the Super Bowl is sponsored by Pepsi so that she was like banned from it. But I think also the Super Bowl, a lot of artists do the Super Bowl. And I'm not saying all the artists that do the Super Bowl, but a lot of them do it after like they've hit their peak and it's like kind <laughs> of like a glory mm. roundup 
a glory roundup, a glory roundup of all their amazing career moments. And Taylor is still on the rise, yo. It's not mm-hmm. time yet. <laughs> um, so also in Taylor Swift news, we had some Taylor Swift New Jersey news. Okay. My mom oh boy. messaged me in the morning the other day. She's like, did you hear that Taylor Swift was in New Jersey? And I was like, yeah, I mean, she was there months ago. Is that what you're talking about when she wore that Stony Brook sweatshirt? And she was like, no, recently. And with her boyfriend, I was like, mom, you don't know. Taylor doesn't have a boyfriend. <laughs> um, but then I went on the internet because I had just woken up and I saw all these TikToks of her down in Long Beach Island in LBI because Jack Antonoff is getting married or got married this weekend. And she they were at like this little restaurant in LBI for his rehearsal dinner and it was swarmed, swarmed with people, with fans waiting to get a glimpse of Taylor Swift. And this is what she means when she says, I feel like I'm a monster and everyone's a sexy baby. Like she can't go anywhere without causing an enormous ruckus and fucking things up because of all these people. Like There was a whole traffic. No one could get through because the streets were packed with people. It was great. But like there was also so many other celebs at the wedding too yeah. like Lana Del Rey was there Shanning Tatum like she got out of the car with um I think like Channing and um uh oh what's her face Zoe Kravitz yeah but it was Taylor Swift I feel that really caused the uproar because Swifties are intense <laughs> like Channing Tatum fans are not like Swifties no. <laughs> um and then today in the news we're seeing that taylor swift made a 15 minute speech for jack at the wedding and that he ribbed him she ribbed him for um never thanking his wife now in his acceptance speeches <laughs> But she always thanks him. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We didn't hear the speech, but like I saw that was the headline everywhere. And I oh. saw people being like, oh, 15 minute speech. Uh, I want to shoot myself at minute five if, at a wedding if the speech is going on that long. I was like, you've obviously never heard a never heard a good speech. If you want to yeah. shoot yourself at minute five, please. Like I was getting so annoyed scrolling through Twitter responses. I think my speech at Heather's wedding was 15 minutes. Oops. No, I think 10 minutes is a great amount. I don't think yours was 15 minutes, but like, even if it was, if it's a good speech, it's a good speech and you're telling a good, good story. But I think mine at Katie's was eight minutes. Um, but I planned for it to be 10 minutes. I was just talking really fast um, <laughs> because nerves, <laughs> um, but I would love to hear her speech, but it was private and this is a private event. Like you can't, I, it's just not right to storm someone else's private event to see a celebrity, and I feel really bad. Um, Natasha, you have some news for us. Yeah, so we just heard that a federal judge has actually ruled that AI cannot be copyrighted. So this is really amazing um, yes. for the strikes and for AI and, and the protection of creatives in, in general. Um, because if you use AI to say like write a whole book, um, none of that intellectual property, you, you cannot own any of that. So yep. it protects the, it protects humankind and, and yep. what we can do um, in, in the form of creating art or any form of art. So yes, that's amazing news. Yeah, if, if you have an AI write your script, anyone can take that script and do anything with it because there mm-hmm. is no copyright on it because that script is using other people's scripts to learn how to write their script. Mm-hmm. So very exciting news and hope, well, I mean, hopefully this will set groundwork for these strikes because they, if they can't have a computer writing their shit, then have it copyrighted that's a problem (laughs) that's a problem for these corporations and now you can use the ai as a tool to help you know brainstorm or like outline or whatever the fuck they want to use it for without taking away these jobs from actual human writers so that's what makes writing special is that it is about the human experience (laughs) Like, it's not the same. Art is special because it's about the human experience. Like, a picture is not the same not drawn by a person because 
the whole point of it is to feel a connection to humanity. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. All right. We have a couple quick pieces of Patreon news. Uh, Patreon, we, on Patreon, now, if you are a patron, we are a listener-supported podcast. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash those working fangirls. We have so many fun perks over there. And now we're offering, Patreon is offering an annual subscription. And when you subscribe annually, you get a 16% off discount, which is a little over a month for free uh, yeah. when you add it all up, which is really cool. So if you want to take advantage of that and subscribe for the year instead of month to month, you'll get a discount. And if you don't know, our biggest, our most regular perk here is at the $5 level. And we do an extra half an hour show every single week. That's more personal and digs into some deeper topics. So definitely check those out. Our link is the link to the Patreon is in the show notes and in the description if you're watching on YouTube. And Spotify just merged with Patreon finally. For so long, Spotify was the only podcast listening app that didn't really support a relationship with Spot- with Patreon. Now mm. you can link your accounts so that the exclusive Patreon feed comes up in your Spotify and you can listen to it there, which is super convenient. I love listening to podcasts in Spotify. And now the Working Fangirls XL feed is available there. So that's super cool. I will leave some sort of link to some sort of directions on how to do that if you can't figure it out in the show notes. <laughs> I will Google it. But basically, I think I searched um, like those Working Fangirls exclusive feed or something or those Working Fangirls XL in Spotify and it popped up. It just says like has a little lock on it because you have to merge your accounts to your patreon to get it all right i think that's all our news today anyone else have any natasha did you have anything else you want to touch on no we can move right into the lightning round all right we're gonna move on to our lightning get to know sasha section before we move on into our discussion are you ready sasha i'm ready and so is fiona who's about to bark okay (laughs) sasha favorite month of the year October, big spooky season. Nice. Go-to meal for dinner. Ollie olio. Ollie olio. (laughs) Don't don't pronounce it correctly. (laughs) Um, Favorite city? Oh, Edinburgh. Ooh, nice. Or Tokyo. (laughs) Okay, okay. If you could go to space, would you? Yes. Oh, without a doubt. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I wrote a sci-fi novel. I know, but still, there's so much death up there. <laughs> also in the sea. <laughs> okay. What song do you know? A, a song that you know all the words to. Happy birthday. Wow. Low, yeah. l- low pickings there. <laughs> Don't know many okay. songs. If you were a color, what color would you be? Red. Okay. Would you rather live on your dog's back, shrunk to Tinkerbell size, or have your dog glued to your back at normal size forever? She's already glued to my back, so definitely the second one. I think you need to think about this. She's no, because I would be like catapulted off. She runs around in circles. I would get very dizzy. So you're just gonna have her on your back every day at work, and she already sleeps on my head. And she's already, like, glued to my side. Honestly, like, she doesn't weigh that much. Can you imagine being on a date with just, like, a dog on your back? Honestly, like, I always, like, consider dates with um, Fiona being involved in them the best kind of date, so. (laughs) All right. Uh, Go to gum. Gum? Do you chew chew gum? No. Okay, there we go. Tic Tacs. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> what flavor? Mint. Okay. Not orange. Which, which color? Oh, I like the orange. White? I like the white one. White. Wait, is there more colors than white? I don't know. There's white, there's, there's like orange, green. there's that mint green. Yeah. Oh, but like the UK doesn't like like supplying too many flavors. They oh, like to they keep don't like humble. anything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. So they only have the white ones is what you're saying? Well, I've only ever seen the white ones, but I'm the TikTok girl at work. So I always offer TikToks <laughs> to people. Nice. And like 
my wonderful sister Gemma always rolls her eyes. She's like, Sasha, nobody wants Tic Tacs. <laughs> I would take a Tic Tac. Exactly. I, I really like how the white ones have like a little marshmallow kick before you get to the right. Mint, you know, that's the best yeah. part of it. And then the rest of it, it's like, okay, my no, it's breath fine. is fresh. It's just mint. <laughs> I found one on the floor by my desk the other day. I ran out of Tic Tacs like last week. So I'm kind of like, at least they're sticking around. <laughs> Are you saying you ate it? No, no, it was just okay. on the floor. It was just hanging out okay. there. And I'm like, you All poor right. sad soul. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to move on to our main discussion. I think that was a great lightning round. Good work, Sasha. Good work Thank with you. those answers. All right, before we move into our main discussion, I want to take a quick second to thank all of you listening out there right now. We appreciate you being here with us so much. If you're all watching the visual version on our YouTube we would really appreciate it if you hit the like button, if you leave us a comment, that really helps us share the show with more people. Word of mouth is huge. If you're enjoying the show, telling a friend about it is really helpful to us. If you want to leave us a review on one of our the podcast apps, that's super helpful to us on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. It's really easy. You just click the star rating. You can give us five stars if you enjoy the show. That would be really, really nice and um, help us out. And if you want to support the show in a bigger way, we have a Patreon, which I just talked about. Lots of fun perks. Link is in the show notes. We couldn't do this without your support. This is a listener supported show. So your support on the Patreon goes such a long way for us to being able to put our time and efforts into this. And we love doing this. So, and just, just watching on YouTube and sharing and all of that makes such a big difference. So thank you so much for being here. Yes. Thank you all. Okay, so right. we are going to move into the main discussion and I'm going to act as like, the interviewer here so um so this discussion day we're going to be talking about publishing like in the booktube world and i really wanted to start at the very beginning here um because both of you guys uh and we heard from sasha a little bit at the beginning but um both we all are youtubers and i really want to know like when and why did you start your youtube channel like what was like your main intention when you first started sasha if you want to go first yeah, um, well, mine's more of like a sad note, uh, but also I think it's very prominent and very important in my story. So my mom died when I was 15 and a half. Um, the half is very important during those years. Mm -hmm. But um, we both had such a intensive love for reading. We love books. We love sharing um, them with each other. Um, and, you know, my mom got me into Hunger Games and Divergent. And so when she died, um, it was in the middle of the Divergent series. And I just wanted to like walk with her um, and kind of like make her proud, um, you know, throughout my journey with understanding what literature was through her eyes and within mine, because I wouldn't have been the woman I am today without her, because I, ne I couldn't read until I was in fourth grade um, because of my dyslexia was so severe that I was struggling day in and day out. And she was always my champion. And I want to always walk with her whenever I do anything that she helped inspire me to do. And that is one of the major things that inspired me to do BookTube. Um, even though it was not called BookTube at that time, um, I wanted to start talking about books with people who are like-minded because I did not have my mom to talk to anymore. Um, and so I started my YouTube channel um, after starting a fan page for the Mortal Instrument series. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of took Wait. off from there. What was it called before you keep going? The Mortal Instruments It was called page? The Shadow Hunters. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. You got The Shadow Hunters domain name? Was it theshadowhunters.com? Um, yes, yes I, I did. And honestly, it was like the best thing ever because it really helped save me from what could have been when it comes to parental loss. I yeah. was, I could have like spiraled, but instead I found books. And I told Cassandra Claire that in my various emails to her. Um, as a Aww. fan and she responded to them that's the great thing about it and the last gift my mom ever gave me was a um, Morgenstern ring which was like Aww. amazing I know and um, it was incredible uh, it was from Hebel Designs a great yep. indie um, jewelry designer Love and them. they sent it to me right away so I could wear it to her memorial um, and it was oh. everything to me. And that series saved my life and books saved my life um, because I don't know where I would be right now without books. So that's what got me started on YouTube because I just wanted to have an outlet for all my feelings 
in all the feels. And to this day, I, I owe it all to my mom. And I probably wouldn't have been on YouTube if it was for my mom because my mom always said, don't be online because <laughs> she was scared about the online Aww. predators and online friends. Um, oh, yeah. Meanwhile, I'm with two of my closest online friends for over a decade now Aww. on your podcast, which I'm so excited about. Yeah. Yeah. Sasha, that was a really beautiful answer. Thank yeah. you. Actually, I didn't know a lot of that. Really? No, you crazy. haven't really talked about that. Yeah. So yeah. it's really yeah. nice to hear it. Yeah, yeah, I guess I don't really talk about it that much because you guys met me later on in life. Um, not later on, but like like a few years after that. I mean, and I guess we... 2014. How old were you in 2014? Um, yeah, I was right. tw- six, 17. But actually, I started YouTube, now that I think about it, like um, in 2013. But mm-hmm. I wasn't very open about this stuff. I didn't even tell my like, yeah. you know, girls at my all-girls school uh, about my YouTube channel because I didn't really think much of it. I don't think much about telling people about things well it's hard um, to talk about that stuff back especially well especially the stuff about your mom but also youtube was kind of weird back then so it was hard to discuss exactly and um once i told everybody that that was super cool but that was like four years like almost like in graduation year um down the line and everybody was like you have a youtube channel that has like over a hundred thousand followers and i'm like i guess (laughs) But like, yeah, no, it was like part of my journey, but I think that it was fully my journey and not anybody else's. I feel like that's something to harbor and to enjoy because you're not doing it for anyone else besides yourself. And it is a safety, um, well, it's a safe place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Christine, uh, what about you? Yeah, so I started my YouTube channel when I was in high school because I knew I wanted to make things. I knew I wanted to create and I was making music videos at the time and I wanted some place to put them. And this was before vlogging was big. So this was 2006. This was really early. (laughs) YouTube was cat videos, but I was like, I want to post my music videos somewhere that I can send a link to someone to watch. So that's Mm -hmm. why I started YouTube in general. But then of course, I slowly got more involved in what YouTube is you know vloggers started cropping up around 2008 2009 that were gaining traction and i started watching those people like the vlog brothers and then charlie mcdonald and that's how i learned what vlogging was and i was very lonely like i didn't have anybody to talk about the books i was reading with so i was making Mm -hmm these comedy music videos, but I was in this bubble where I felt so lonely reading all these books. Like I had read Twilight. I was devouring everything that Stephanie Meyer ever recommended. And I had no friends to talk about them with. And that can be really isolating, especially when you're in college, you're far away from everyone, you know, if you're introverted. So my friends started to be not friends. My time started to be spent on YouTube. And I thought to myself, maybe I can make a vlog talking about some of the books I've read and maybe I'll find friends that actually read. And so I eventually did that in 2010. So like years later, I had already made all these talking list videos where I was just had music videos and such. And yeah, I made the first book video about the Hunger Games in March of 2010. And I was really nervous that people weren't going to like it because nobody likes books. Because all through high school, I was like the weird girl with the books in the study hall by herself. <laughs> so, Emily says, I remember your Glee videos with Olivia. Oh, my God. I feel like there was like two. <laughs> I'm so weird. Um, anyway, so I started making book videos and... That eventually started to roll faster as I started reading more and more books. And that was about 2012 where I was reading like two to three books a week. And I would make book talks about every single book that again, I was just making like book reviews, like solid reviews for every book. I wasn't doing any of like the classic booktube things that we know now, like the tags and stuff I didn't even know existed, but yeah, that's how I started. And then it just became so much more as my comedy channel started to like peter out because I was focusing so much on like book based content and the book channel surpassed the comedy channel. So yeah, that's my base there. (laughs) 
Well, yes, which I think is important because I kind of wanted to know, like, at what point did you know that you wanted to write? Or did you even think that was, like, was that something in your realm of skills at that point in your YouTube career? Me? Christine. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I knew I loved writing. So I knew I wanted to write in like second grade when I started a book on Microsoft Word, but then my parents made it sound like it wasn't a thing. You know, like there was no writer like as a job. And so I kind of put that on the back burner as something like that I would think of as a career, but I was always writing like at sleepovers. I made my best friend write a short story with me and I told it our tradition that every midnight we would write a short story and oh a poem. <laughs> That's so I cute. Didn't, I didn't learn till later on that like she had no inclination to do this, but I was like forcing it on her. Um, oh my gosh. Um, and like in college, I was concentrated in screenwriting because I didn't believe that I could write a whole book for a long time until I read Twilight. So I thought a script was easier to write because it wasn't as long. And then when I was doing my comedy channel i would write scripts all the time for sketches i wanted to do like comedy sketches and anything comedic so i always knew i wanted to write it was like about finding the belief that i could be a an author that i could write a full book and that came freshman year of college uh finally i was like oh wait i think i could do this because i didn't read a book about a teenage girl literally till then mm. <laughs> so that's uh it's kind of an issue I, I think that's different now that there's lots of ya that people are devouring as young girls and realizing that people like to read books about young women yeah the female dollar Shocker. goes very far can i um, just really quickly insert that a neighbor of mine watched yellow jackets and it's a woman that's like in her 50s and she was like yeah i was completely turned off of it about off of it by at first glance because it was just a young a bunch of young girls and then i watched it it was like excuse me <laughs> that show is so good i was addicted to it i just watched it like last month it's fantastic yeah. it is but oh my god so the fact that like young women being on the poster was a detriment just shows how ingrained in society it is to hate young women and what they like Jenny, you know what i well, don't hate on these girls they'll get you I <laughs> So, um, Sash, okay, when did you know you wanted to write? Um, so that's the thing. So I uh, never believed that I could ever be a writer. Um, I have severe dyslexia, so severe that when I was younger, I thought it was normal for words to float up and turn themselves around and get mixed up on the page. So I was reading at a kindergarten level um, when I was in the fourth grade and that was something that was very severely um uh just disheartening for me because I was not like my other students um but then when I became um an adult I finally got the help I needed I went through so much therapy speech therapy um visual therapy um which was so much fun I remember one time I was like skating on a mirror with like um with like shaving cream and I'm like how is this therapy but it was therapy. It was touch therapy. It was great. Um, that sounds and awesome. My mom was such a campaigner for me to become like my classmates, but she said, "Sasha, you're you're not meant to be normal because normal is non-existent. You are meant to be you." And she was always saying that you're special in the best kind of way. So I um, didn't really um, ever try to like write a book until I decided to write a reverse. Um, alien invasion where instead of uh what was it I i'm trying to like remember it now it was pretty good it was a good plot but also not a good ex execution but like it was like they invaded us not we invaded them which like obviously makes sense now because there's been so many renditions of that but like i thought it was like on to something but i <laughs> described the girl's hair for the first like chapter of the book and i'm like you're so vain um but it wasn't until uh lindsay cummings my co-author of zenith um, we, we were friends since I was a blogger and I was reviewing her book. Her book was the very first arc I got of a novel. And I felt so special about that. I was like, oh my God, how cool. Um, it's magical, but, the first arc. 
write. And then my first book that I got for free was my best friend JD's novel. And I'm like, now we're starting a company together. And I'm like, ah, all this stuff is like wild, how we kind of transition from one thing to another. And we stick with it for years. But um, yeah, when it comes to um, Lindsay, we always used to joke around about writing a book together, but it always was a joke until my freshman year in college where I was in college because both my parents were professors. Um, you know, it was the route that I should have taken. Uh, this just like a plot twist. I, I never finished school. I never finished university. I don't have a degree in writing. I don't have a degree in anything. But I have a degree in life, I like to say, um, because in my first year, Lindsay said, do you actually want to write a book together? And I said, you know what? Yeah, why not? What would we write? And so we put a poll up on Twitter asking the audience what Classic they would like Sasha us to poll. write. We had a poll. Guess what the percentages were, though. So 30% said sci-fi, 70% said fantasy. So of course we went with what people did not want. We wrote a sci-fi because that's what we wanted to write. Um, because uh, Lindsay, her father, really got her into science fiction um, when she was younger and she had yet to kind of delve into that um, because she wrote dystopian novels before then. I'm actually a character in one of her novels and I rammed um, a train into a building and died um, in her novel. So that was quite um, an experience. Wow. Um, wow. And then I killed her off in our own book. Um, without her knowing. So, I mean, that's her fault for not realizing. <laughs> um, so, um, but no, um, so when it comes to like, you know, when did I think that I could write? I didn't believe it until I had a friend to help me realize that I could do something that I never thought I could do because I did have an imagination. I did have, you know, somewhat of a skill to write. But if it wasn't for Lindsay, who I also call Professor Lindsay, I don't <laughs> think that I would have had the skill set to write Breaking Time and Fracturing Fate. Um, Fracturing fright. I can never pronounce my own book. Um, but I wouldn't have that skill set today because I learned so much from her rather than the professor who told me never to write a young adult book um, in uni because, Excuse yeah, me? Miss Dr. What was his name? Mr. Papernick. Um, oh, my. Um, I will call him out. I sent him a copy of the New York Times bestsellers list um, when I hit number one. Um, oh, I was shit. Like, and this was with a young adult science fiction novel. He said... You should just write Jewish fiction because that's what I did, and you're Jewish, so you should have your um, family story out there. I'm like, that's on the that's on the backlog, you know. I'm gonna write that eventually, but what I want to write right now is something for my heart and something that I feel passionate about, which is for young adults like myself at the time. And I wanted to write something that really like was mystical, and magical, and also science fiction. Um, and I did that, and. Um, it was because I had the best teammate in the game and we really created something beautiful. Um, so yeah, um, I never, I never like wrote in journals. I never wrote books before really besides fan fiction. I did write at FBI. Um, that is still writing. Fan fiction is fanfiction. still writing. What are you talking about? I'm so about? sad I can't get to it, um, <laughs> anymore because the website got taken down, but it was a Justin Bieber criminal mind. I was just going to say, was it a Justin Bieber fan fiction? Yes. <laughs> so it was called FBI Justin girlfriend, cop store boyfriend. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wait, I was again? obsessed with Justin Bieber. And what uh, is you it know called? What? I'm not anymore. I was called FBI boyfriend. No, FBI girlfriend, pop star boyfriend. <laughs> And she saved him from like a gunman. Um, amazing and amazing. I, I, it was so a she thing. was like a bodyguard um, for him. No, she was just there. <laughs> she was just there. She was just, she FBI was just there. Just was um, there. There's no plot to it, but like the thing is, I always like demeaned myself and my skill set because I thought that I couldn't do something. And what I always try to tell people who do struggle with learning disabilities is that you can. It's just like yeah. find the other route to mm -hmm. doing it. Yeah. Because there's not a straightforward route when it comes to writing. I've written all my books in different ways. And it works for my brain. So just figure out a route that works for yours. And yeah. just know that you can do it. It just sometimes takes a little bit longer. But it is possible. Just have good people around you to help you um, when it comes to, like, you know, beta readers and just, um, you know, proofreaders and just the people who actually help, like, um, help you understand like how great your writing is and how to improve it further. Yeah. Yeah. Katie said something that I think is really true that every, a lot of writers have the book that made them want to write and then the book that made them believe they can write. And I yes. also think on top of that, there's the person that made them yep. believe that they can write. And for you, I, it sounds like that was Lindsay, right? 
Um, yeah, it was Lindsay and it was like all my writer friends beyond that too. Like he's like, we wrote two books together, but after that I ventured into writing Breaking Time. But Breaking Time was the book of my heart and soul before I wrote Xena. Um, yeah. But I didn't have the, you know, the experience to write it yet. I really wanted to learn the skill set and I did and Kirkus Reviews yeah. called it um, a really good thing. Um, what did they say? They said it was called, um, they called Zenith mediocrity at its best um, or at its <laughs> finest. Um, and I'm like, thank you, Kirkus. Uh, but also, Kirkus <laughs> is known to be very, very like harsh. But then um, they called uh, Fracturing Fate a like a love story that spans centuries. Like, um, oh, and it was actually so, really sweet. Congratulations, Sasha. So that's you amazing. got to see like the evolution of yeah. um, the craft and the yeah. skill set, but also it depends on the reviewer you get with Kirkus because it's not the same one every time. But I oh, no. do, yeah. I do believe that um, it takes years to like you know hone your craft, and you'll never hone it like correctly because we. Perfection well, is nothing's not ever tangible. perfect. Yeah, no. if, if you just do the best you can and you exactly. keep getting better as right you right for you. More. That's all I have to say. Yeah, but also Katie is so right. Also, she just called me a demigod, and I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> yeah, so it's so powerful that it only takes it, it. Just like so many things, it takes one person believing in you mm-hmm. to completely change your mind. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah, I just realized like while I was dedicating my book three that my freshman roommate is like the person that made me believe in myself to write so i did she's i dedicated to three different people and she's one of them and i haven't talked to her in years but when i wrote short stories she'd want to read them and then she'd like tell me all these like great give me all these compliments and tell me how funny they were and she literally gave me the confidence to think that i could do this and I I was like appalled because I had never thanked her in any of the acknowledgments or anything. I actually like kind of in, in meshed like some of the things that she had said to me, like that idea into pilot in again, but better, you know, he says some things about wanting to read her writing. And that was totally because of her. Like she would, I would write something and she'd be like, can I read it? And I'd be like, you want to read it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's like, like they do. That had, that had never happened to me mm-hmm. before. And that one, like, that one person can change everything. And it's so yeah. beautiful and magical. And that's what you always have to remember, even when you're when you're writing a book. Like, if you change one, if you make one person believe in themselves or one person feel less alone or one person feel happy when they're in their darkest moment, you know, mm-hmm. it's worth it because yeah, it can genuinely. change their lives. Also, yeah. just like a, a quick note, um, if you do want to acknowledge her with reprints, I believe that you can. Um, and if well, it's not I did with now. a physical She's, copy, okay, guys. I so literally dedicated the book to her. <laughs> I used to get so stressed with acknowledgments because I was like, I want to acknowledge everyone. But with my like recent book, I was like, you know what? The people that matter like um, are already in the past books and my like five pages of acknowledgments. Um, they know who they are. You guys are a part of my acknowledgments, but like beyond that, it's like dedications like are truly spectacular because you finally get to be like, this one's for you. Yeah. 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 Katie says letting someone read your writing is like letting them live in your imagination. And it's so special when they're excited to be there and explore it. Yeah. That's so true. Well, Katie, she's just giving out truths. I mean, yeah. Or they're terrified by you because of it. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I'm writing a psychological thriller currently, and I have to say, people are horrified. <laughs> Amazing. I'm excited. Okay, so, you know, um, um, let me rephrase this. Okay, so, you know, nowadays, a lot of people get into social media with, like, the intention of, like, having it be a next step or having it... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, be something to, uh, to support some, something else in their career. But back then when we started, we were young and we just did it for fun. Um, so like, what were your hopes and dreams prior to becoming a YouTuber and how did that evolve as you grew an audience? And then also along that line, like, when did you think it was possible for you to actually publish your writing? Prior to, starting my youtube channel what were my hopes and dreams is what the first part of that question was right Mm -hmm. natasha 
So I wanted to be a writer and I was thinking I was going to write scripts. And then of course I started thinking I could write a book, but this was after four years of concentrating on like screenwriting classes. So I tried to write a book straight out of college. And this is when I was growing my YouTube channel. So I think I had just hit 10,000 subscribers, but I wasn't thinking of it as like something that's going to, I don't know, like make me publish a book or something. I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't even a job yet. It was like, there was the inkling that I could make it into a job, but it wasn't yet. Mm -hmm. And this was the year that I did make it a job, but I was trying to write this book about mermaids. Um, and it was just not happening because it wasn't <laughs> the idea, you know, mm. and I hadn't had the like this is the idea moment yet but it would come in 2013 as i pondered writing but i knew once i started rolling on youtube that i wasn't gonna write this book until i felt like i had a solid youtube career mm -hmm. on under my feet so that i knew i had income coming in because out of college you're just like I, there's no money streams mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you already have a job secured. You have to find your job. And I was like, I'm going to make my job. It was 2012. <laughs> YouTube was just starting to be a job for some people. And I was like, I can do this. I see how sponsorships work and I'm going to like, you know, reach a level where I could approach these companies and be like, we should work together because I was already starting to work with like, I, I just got my Ford Fiesta. Wait, no. I did it. I saw people getting it. I got yeah. the next round. <laughs> and I was like, I can do this. I can make it happen. So I just day and night lived and breathed um, YouTube until I turned it into something. And then in 20, at 2015, I was like, okay, I've got YouTube now and it's time to start writing my book. Like I knew I wanted to write and I didn't want to put that on the back burner forever. It's time to prioritize that because there comes a point on YouTube where you will hit the plateau or like you'll just start to slow and i think in 2015 i just saw like i was growing at like an exponential insane rate for a time and then in 2015 it started just like slowing now i'm looking at him like that was still amazing growth it was like yeah. 5,000 subscribers a month i was growing at 11,000 subscribers a month at the peak though and that was batshit and like now i'm looking at it like holy fuck like can you imagine no <laughs> um, can you imagine but Time i remember puts everything it, in perspective it's crazy yeah i remember when it hit 5,000. i was like wow i'm really slowing oh my god <laughs> like, time to write the book this is it um but I still think I hit, I fit, I hit the perfect time because now looking mm. back, like when the book was coming out, I was like kind of still there, you know, still rocking. Um, but yeah, I, I started just making one video a week and writing and uh, I just knew that as, as my channel was growing, I knew that it was going to be able to help me with whatever creative endeavors I wanted to do. And on top of that, it was helping me just like hone my skills as a creator in general, as a storyteller. Like the, the idea that like a YouTuber couldn't write a story, especially like a YouTuber that does storytelling for most of their, right? <laughs> most of their videos is like, again, baffling. Like you're just not thinking about it like that when you go in to like judge a YouTuber for writing a book. But my main, I was going to say my main shit, my main schlep, my main thing was like story times and sketches yeah. and like everything was story based. Um, and so it was really helping to hone that craft on top of just like reading constantly as part of your, your job. So it's like, it's literally all baffling to like, when you take a step back and look at all of that and then be like, that person, how did they think they can write a book? <laughs> like, um, but that's what everyone, uh, who was watching a YouTuber thought when any YouTuber mm -hmm. said like, I want to write a book. Uh, well, so anyway, I think I covered the question. Yeah. I, I, I like, yeah. when did you think it was like actually though possible? Maybe this one's for Sasha though. Like, when did you think that this was actually possible for you to publish? I always believed that I would be able to like use this base that I was working so hard to create to help me get published. So mm -hmm. I like, oh, yeah. So yeah wow 
I have a different answer to all this. Okay, <laughs> go yeah. for it. What is it? Yeah. Well, actually, like I always said, I was always a reader, never a writer. Um, and I was going to school for writing literature and publishing when I went to Emerson College, which I have a video on my YouTube channel, me being accepted to the uni, and I was so excited. And then I quit after a year um, because I got my book deal. Um, it fell into place in the best kind of way because it also helped my family out financially, but also helped me out in the way that I never thought possible, where it came like, oh my God, I actually have a big girl job and that is writing and I have a story to tell and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. But I always wanted to be a book marketer. I always wanted to be the one who is behind the book, who helps push it to stardom or at least to the Amazon charts or the um, New York Times bestsellers list. Um, I never expected myself uh, to be the one behind the book um, when it comes to writing it. Um, and so I'm still shocked to this day. Um, it still is quite surreal that I've published four novels that I care so much about and I love so much and still have somehow landed up where pre-author Sasha wanted me to end up but without a degree. So right now I'm working and publishing still. I'm a um, social media manager, uh, graphic designer, and cover designer at Joffy Books. That's exactly where little Sasha wanted herself to end up. Oh, but now so I just cool have four books under my belt. Yeah, um, yeah, I've designed over 100 covers um, in the past six months. Uh, or I want to say 100. It feels like 100. Mm -hmm. um, um, Best-selling novels there. Um, but also it's because I have an eye for graphic design. And you no, I don't have, have a degree. Thank you. you. But I don't have a degree in Photoshop. Do I know how to use Photoshop half the time? No. Uh, but I do Sasha's know Sasha's like the Photoshop queen. What are you no, talking about? I don't know Photoshop. <laughs> I know how to do like, I know how to extract objects from Photoshop. I just feel like I always thought of you as the Photoshop queen. No, I actually don't know Photoshop at all. And that's like the most hilarious thing about my Remember job for is that our shadow hunter things i would always send you like pictures to oh, do like photoshop I'm really good at magic. using apps that allow me that <laughs> me but it's too. not photoshop like i don't know photoshop um but like okay. i do illustrated covers mainly at work but okay. like my um wait what was the question again just because i almost forgot when did you believe that <laughs> oh i never be believed publish <laughs> i never believed um because the thing is i feel like it's i'm very open and honest about this it fell into my lap. Hmm. I am very grateful for the course events that happened that led to my publishing experience because Lindsay and I were already writing a book. We're self-publishing it. Mm. Oh, that's and right. Yeah, we were going to serialize our whole entire novel. Um, um, and, um, you know, we we're going to serialize it in six parts. We never thought that it would be published. We never thought that there is going to be this power behind my social media following that would catapult it towards the New York Times bestsellers list. That's why when it hit number one, I I literally fell to the ground. I was like, the, the fuck? I think <laughs> I was, I was there with you guys. Were, we, were we, we were at Universal Studios, right? No, I think that's when we found out you were going to get published. When you found out you hit number one, we were no, at no, the no. LA tour stop. Oh no! That no, was, no, no, um, She's no, no, no! She's talking about the ebook. Ebook. Oh, the yeah. ebook. Yes, yes. You were at Universal yeah. Studios. I was not there with you. There was a two time. Yeah, um, I was there with my friend Connor Wolf. Actually, I think, I think. Yes, um, I, I saw have the worst him. memory of the past. Um, and like, um, he was from my friend from Emerson. Um, and I fell to the ground in the middle of the line to a ride. I never expected that um, at all. Um, and. It led to us not then serializing the rest of the series. We ended up writing it for HarperCollins under Eden Tower Press or Harlequin Teen at the time. Um, and it was a whirlwind. I was 19 years old and now I'm 26. And, you know, I look back at my experience with Zenith and Nexus. And I think, wow, how the heck did you do that? <laughs> I was just going to add really quick that it's kind of like really crazy. As we're discussing this, I'm realizing like when you were like, how, when did you believe that you could be published? It's just like, I feel like that was like, I was manifesting it from like the big, like from the beginnings of this being a job, which is so weird. Like I believed in myself so hard. And now that I'm like a little older, it's so much harder. Like it's easier to believe in yourself right? and like, just like, power of the universe i believe in you and that christine like it's so much harder <laughs> once you get older because you're like 
how did I do that before? And then you realize it's just age. Yeah, the world just like starts to slap you around a little bit more because you've just been around for longer and I like it's harder. It <laughs> it's okay, very different. Not... Yeah, yeah. Natasha, go ahead. I mean, like with that, like, so around this time, though, a lot of like the bigger YouTubers, because we were, you know, all in our small niche of BookTube and it was even hard for us to get a panel at, you know, freaking VidCon at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. But a lot of the bigger YouTubers at this time were getting book deals and were having ghostwriters write mm -hmm. their well, books. Were, a lot of people were doing memoirs, though. It was a different yeah. thing. No. And they were like 20 years old. Well, I mean, we can, like, Zoella had a book, um, and that yeah, was ghostwritten. Zoella that was a, a fiction novel. And even, um, like, uh, Joey Graceffa had, like, a fiction, like, sci fi fantasy novel. Yeah, it came out, like, 2016, I think. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, you know, we had, you know, our own little like niche of book tube and we, you guys weren't given deals. Like you wrote the book, you, um, you know, oh, yeah. queried for an agent and then, you know, went out to, you know, to get it published. Um, like what were like your wildest dreams when it came uh to actually knowing you would have an audience behind you when the book when like when your book actually became published i feel like Ooh. you can't have them you can't have yeah you don't them. have any mm -hmm. you like you just genuinely. are like so excited to have the book being published like yeah, holding I, it in your hands having your name yeah. on a cover so, so your words was, on the page so, so that was the, the the big dream was holding it in your hands yeah. and, and and yeah everything yeah. else is just like yeah. cake and excitement because you don't want to you know how i am about like jinxing anything yes. so i don't even like to say anything out loud <laughs> to it. i just like, like to like stay humble also like because of the fact that like all I ever wanted to do was sign my own book. Because, you know, we all, all of us have signed uh, our names on other authors' books when we have gone to events. And people are like, oh, my God, I watched it on YouTube. Can you sign this book? And all I wanted was to sign my own book. That's what stemmed from my knowledge of, like, wanting to have something to sign that was my own, not somebody else's. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? I mean, I wanted to make a difference in some mm -hmm and people's worldview who were young and going into college and feeling really scared. Like I wanted to give people courage to do study abroad and yeah. to push themselves out of their comfort zones. Like that was my wildest dream to have people being like, this book made me study abroad. And so mm -hmm. many people did message me and tell me that. And it was everything, you know, and Aww. everything else was just, icing on the cake like of course yeah. i would like really wanted to go to do a book tour and i got to do it and it was absolutely amazing like stuff mm -hmm. like that though is never stuff that i'm gonna be like my Hoping wildest and... dream yeah dreams that's just stuff that i like really hope gets to happen but i'm not gonna set it as like the dream you know what i mean no. also yeah. like book tour was wild because we sit behind our camera um, and we talk to our camera, but we know we're talking to an amazing base of readers. But it's not until you publish your own book that you actually get to see them face to face. Mm -hmm. I remember going on my first book tour. I was gobsmacked because the thing is, like, I know I say stay humble, but the thing is, like, for some people, it's easy to. And, like, for me, I just, like, see people as friends, and I genuinely mean that. Um, so, like, seeing so many people show up for these events and saying that they grew up with me, because they were the same age as me. Like, a majority of my audience is exactly, like, the same age as me. Um, it was wild to see them in person and be like, you guys are the reason for this today. Um, yes, I did write this book, but it's the incredible backing of our wonderful, um, you know, friends and followers that actually make it happen. And I feel like that is really something that we should shine a light on more often than not because mm -hmm. of the fact that, like, it, we would not be where we are today without our hundreds of thousands of people who follow us. And even though I haven't been on YouTube in the past, like, two and a half years, it still matters to me more than life. In a sense, did you think, like, publishing your book brought you closer to parts of your audience because you were able to share something that was tangible? Um, yes. In so many yes different no. ways. I always thought about how, like, the stuff that I'm putting in the book, I could never say out loud. 
Ooh. like so much of Shane's journey is so personal mm-hmm. and for so long I held it in such a like shameful place as to like where I was in my college headspace at age 20 mm-hmm. and to share it and because at that point I knew that there must have been a lot of people feeling like this but in college I did not um and to be able to share that and have so many people you know relate to it I felt so much closer to all of the people who would say that like they were in the same spot and like that they were I had so many people just sending me pictures of the letter to the reader at the beginning of the book and being mm-hmm. like I cried reading this and that meant so much to mm-hmm. me and honestly like made it was just like before they'd even read the book I felt like I connected on such a deeper level with every single person who picked it up and read that so yeah yeah. Um, sorry. I just got like really like happy because I just saw Abby's message. Abby said something about how she dyed her hair to be the character from your book and yeah. I can't find the message. Abby, she if just you said like my it. saying also fly true. Um, that's something that Lindsay and I came up with and Zena. Mm. Um, that just made my night. Thank you, Abby. And she said she, um, Abby made a book trailer, but yeah, oh, like what, got, like when you published, like what, did you did it feel like this brought you closer to your audience in different ways? I mean, yes and no. So first of all, we were already close to our audience. We got the opportunity to have meet and greets at BookCon, mm-hmm. to have meetups. I always had meetups in every single city that I would go to, and I got to go and see them, which is amazing. So, And I didn't even have a book at that point. Um, but it brought me closer because it made me realize how grateful I am to share a message um, with them that was like, you can have your learning disabilities, and I really like advocate for that. But you can still do your wildest dreams, even if they go against the curve of a learning disability. Yes, I'm very grateful for my editor, though. Um, my wonderful editor, um, Kate Sullivan, she's incredible, and she helps me along the way when it comes to just like writing. Like, I write the book, she helps me sort it out. Because when you're as dyslexic as I am, you switch pros a lot. Let's just say that. Um, and, you know, all these small bits. But, like, same with, like, um, you know, your audience. Like, you know, they are with you. You should share your journey. Not all authors are Jane Eyre. Or, no, that's not the author. Who's the author of Jane Eyre? Jane Eyre. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, exactly. Wait. <laughs> wait, wait, what's her name? Brown? Hold on. No, no. Bronte. Jane- Bronte. Bronte. Emily Bronte. Bronte. I'm, Emily Bronte, one. Charlotte yeah, Bronte, I was like, Hold one on, of the Brontes. Are we all on my so bad at that? I found the tip of my tongue. <laughs> um, but yeah, Emily Bronte. Like you know, um, I feel like, like Charlotte Bronte. <laughs> See, I lost my train of thought. Also, I just wanted to like classify. It's um, nine twenty-five in the UK right now. You're doing okay, great. So you were saying yes and no. So you were talking about the yes. In what ways, no? No, is like, because I always felt close. Um, writing a book was just another step. Um, I still feel very close to everyone. Um, and I don't know when my next book will come out. I don't know if I will ever publish a book again. Who knows? You never know these things. Um, of course, I'll publish a book again, but like it may not be in the same structure it is today. Um, it may be only an ebook. Um, but um, I think that we've always honed in on the fact that we had the opportunity to have meet and greets to have meetups, to um, just run into our amazing, incredible audiences that followed us for years on the slide. Look at me being hip. Um, But like, you know, um, I think that it just, we have the best audience. And I feel like nowadays you don't really find that. Yeah, I would say that's true. So, Um, yeah. You so you guys both went on book tours. Both your books hit the New York Times bestsellers list. Like it was such an exciting time, mm-hmm. I think, for everyone who got to watch and me being your best friend. Um, but what was like when all that was said and done? But what was the reality of it when you once the book was published? Like, what kind of set in first that maybe you didn't think about that would happen? I know for me, coming back to YouTube after releasing a book, there was a complete shift in how I had to 
look at the space in general that I was not expecting. Did you um, see it as like a like like life leading up to being published and then life after being published kind of literally ordeal? it is kind it is kind of like that. Yeah. Because, Sasha, did you feel that way? Or did you feel it um, kind of just Yes, um with my first series. But the second series, no. Yeah. Yeah, well, you were kind of doing other things by the time the second series came out, you know. Well, it's also because I had, I had to compartmentalize, like, uh, my priorities. A lot going on. Yeah. Yeah, I always have a lot going on. But also, it's, like, because I have to prioritize my mental health as well. Of course. You know, because when you publish books, you're going to, like, you know, have so many other people having input and having your own work out there is so different than just having yourself out there. Yeah. Having something on paper is so drastically different. And I bet we'll talk about this um, later, but it was something I was not prepared for with my first series, but for the second series, I'm like, I'm a seasoned veteran, you know, Um, I know what to expect, but also um, I know what to appreciate. And that's very important. You can talk about it now. I think it's this is yeah. like we're rolling into it. So go ahead. I can't believe I like you know, I find it wild that like, yeah, when we were talking about like other YouTubers being published, they were publishing things that weren't like within their realm of what they would talk about on their YouTube channels. And I feel like that was very strange to kind of witness as somebody who was actively writing a book, talking about books online. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew to expect critique and criticism. Um, and one thing I always stand true by is that like everybody has a voice and they're able to voice their opinions on your novels. But as I was so young, I was so young. I was a little baby when I published my novels. Um, Mm -hmm. I was not ready for that at all. Um, I was not ready for negative reviews or that's pretty much it. Um, but like, there was Sasha, they weren't even just negative. They were like coming after you. Like Uh, because a lot of those titles yeah, a lot of those titles were just very cruel titles, and I remember seeing them and being like, I, I can't even, I'm just like making a face. Like, it was like speechless yeah. that people would be so cruel. It hurt me because I know that uh, for Zenith, Lindsay and I did not write a bad book, um, but also I realized that, I had to come to realize that people are allowed to have voice their opinions. But it's not in our space as authors to delve into that. Um, I um, So now that I'm a marketer at Joffy Books, like I always tell my authors, don't read your reviews. Have a specific group of people that you trust to read your reviews. Take out the po- like the good criticism. Leave out the negativity. Because yeah. um, when it comes to our past and our journeys, we don't want it to be tainted by... Um, just sadness because we do work for years on these novels but it's not their fault for not disliking our novels because I feel like it's very valid to review a book critically or also to love it um critically um but it's a it's a sticky situation because like I was not ready for that um I you were also a reviewer so this is the conflict of interest here like Mm -hmm. i think this has to be considered because you're part of this community so we look at it completely different it's not the same Mm -hmm. as and every author has their thing that's going to make their journey challenging and this was our weird shift but being part of this really loving supportive community and always coming here as a safe space and then all of a sudden like put this thing that happens for you that is so amazing and mind-boggling and you think you want to celebrate it so much and then you come to your safe space and it's just an explosion of negativity negativity toward you and you've yep. never conned to this space and felt shitty. And yeah. all of a sudden you're in the space where you think everything is supportive and it feels like it's all turned against you. Mm-hmm. It, exactly. It's scary. You don't know how to navigate it, especially because um, from my, my knowledge, at least, um, I think I was the first you were. booktuber to have a review. And I have to say, um, I have been off YouTube for two and a half years almost. Um, this was one of the reasons, um, because I realized that my mental health is a priority and I was suffering so much. Um, I, it really hurt me. Um, and 
to this day, I think back to baby Sasha. I say baby Sasha, but um, I think back to younger Sasha. And I think, I wish I could give her a hug and say that it's going to be okay. But also, it's not okay for yourself to be criticized, not your work. Um, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I just, it goes beyond just writing books. It goes into the fact that, um, drama channels were booming at the time. Uh, It was the fact that, um, people wanted to get the views. Um, but also they're allowed to dislike your book. That's fine. But I look at my reviews. I never negatively, um, uh, reviewed a book because I know that for me, it's not worth my time, but also that's just me. It's worth other people's times because also you you want truthful reviewers. But for me, I do tend to like most books I read, um, and I don't think that there's any harm in that. Um, I think that there is love in that um, because I'm just like a reader who likes to read. Um, but um, when it comes and- to the fact that there's negativity, I was so young when I published that book. Yeah. And um, people are yeah. allowed to, of course, not like the book. And yeah, it's fine, so but that doesn't to. mean that you're not allowed to feel this hurt when it's in this bubble that you've yeah. always considered to be a support system. That's that's exactly. where it really knocks into you. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. not, it's a different mindset that you've had. So you kind of go into it being like, I have all these friends in this community. And you just think because your friends that you're all going to support each other because in your head, you imagine like if they were putting out a book, I would be so excited about it. And yeah. mm-hmm. there was this weird hesitancy to be excited about it. This is what yep. like, I feel like there's this weird morally gray area Definitely. when like friends in the community you think are going to be supportive, but they either don't mention the book at all. Like it doesn't exist. And that can be really hurtful, even though they they're like trying to draw a moral line. You have to make a decision in these moments. Like, am I going to support my friend? And just like, again, there's also a moral line. There's a couple lines. I drew this in my head here when I was like supporting, like showing Sasha's book and stuff. I was like, I don't want to review it because I don't want to like draw I don't want to, if I don't like it, talk about it. And I'm, cause I'm imagining what people are going to think about my book too. Yeah. Like, I don't want, like, if they don't like it, then I'd rather them just not talk about it. But like, it, I would read it privately and like have my whole thing, but like support the release because I want to be there for my friend. Mm-hmm. And that's what you imagine everyone's going to do. But when the reality is it kind of goes quiet and only exactly. the negative reviews are there and there's no yep. like people being excited about the release at no. all. And that's what was so jarring. It's like, you're like, oh, I I thought that this was like going to be like a warm hug Mm -hmm. and no one wants to talk to me. It's like you've been cut out from the community. Like you're not one of us anymore. You're one of them. And (laughs) it kind of, it really sucks. Do you know why? Because like, um, I don't want to be like, we're the pillars of the community because we're not. Um, There's been uh, booktubers before us which were not like classified as booktubers because it was a non-existent community beforehand. But um, we were the ones who allowed others to dream that they could do both Um, uh, because it was really not seen. But I'm really disappointed in the fact that there's been not many others um, who have been able to do both. Like, you know, do booktube. And uh, like there's Robbie. He's amazing and he has the best um rom-coms um i love robbie mm-hmm. i love robbie so much robbie oh my Reed. god i'm so proud of him so um, proud um and i'm so happy he was uh published with ink yard um and i'm extremely sad i just want to make a note that ink yard is now not a publishing house um they've published me for the past couple of years um the publishing sphere in the u.s is very um saddening but you know what going back to the fact of take a um, chance on me is robbie's book to yes me? take Wait. a chance on me um, is it take a chance on me or like i think if take you... a chance. it's on my bookshelf it, but i say on my it, bookshelf as it is in it's, it's over there <laughs> i actually have his card readily available he has two in my car- he has yeah. two novels out he has two um, novels and he has they're so both many adorable rom-coms I love and them. I, I love the first. Can't oh. think of the names. Robbie's books are called um, "If You Change Your Mind" and "I Like Me." There we um, go. There we go. If you change, change, if you change your mind. It's another Apple song. Yeah. You guys were the first of your kind in our community. Um, the the first to to bridge that gap between reviewer 
and author. And I don't think like you guys were just talking about, you weren't really prepared for how your reception of your book would be or, or how your book would be perceived in our community. And it kind of was a paradigm shift for both of you um, as your career as an author took off while still trying to hold on um, to your YouTube career and, and being a content creator. So how did th like YouTube and social media change for you after you published your book? Oh, can I go first on this? Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a reason I left YouTube. Um, I, I was terrified of being online. Um, I was scared. I was disheartened. Uh, the community that I found was no more. Um, and it was something that till this day, um, I'm fearful of. Um, and I'll be honest about that. Um, it's because I have always been told by people who meet me that I'm the same online as I am offline. Um, and that is something that's so wonderful, but also it made me feel like people were just trying to poke and jab, um, which is fine. Like people can be the way that they are, but I'm just not that individual who can stomach it. Um, I'm a very sensitive soul. These two know it, um, especially Tasha, who has seen me <laughs> cry one too many times. Um, but it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel. It's okay to have these emotions. But for me, I was, you know, I felt like I was being um, hit when I was already down. Many mm -hmm. people don't know what you're experiencing offline. And I've been through quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But so has so many people, yes. But your own individual experience should not be compared to others. Um, and when I was going through the lowest point of my life with, um, severe depression, um, and just, um, loss and grief. just all these things, grief, <laughs> because my dad died, um, you know, uh, two years ago, um, you know, I've been through a lot, but also, yes, of course we could say people have been through more, but I had to f focus on myself and, Social media really was the reason and the people who were negative were the reason why I left. And I know people say that you should stand true to yourself, but I could not stand true to myself when I would look at comments and look at numbers and just feel disheartened and feel sad because um, I always like to say that I was just being me online um, and I was always trying to well, you advocate. Were yeah. You were like you were young when you started, so I was. It was I was a baby. So I'm 26 th now. I, this I was, was a baby then. This was the only job I say with quotations yeah. um, that you had known, mm -hmm. and then you became an author, and um, like it was kind of like letting go of something that you spent years building, um, and alongside. And I can speak this because Sasha's my best friend, but like alongside mm -hmm. like all the mental health and, and, and losing your dad and, you know, and, and, and losing all of that, losing your mom, you also had to lose something else. And yep. I think you had to protect, but you ha also had to protect yourself. And I'm like so proud of you for making it through. Oh, babe, I wouldn't have done it without you, genuinely. Like um, Tasha was my saving grace throughout all my loss because not only did I lose my dad recently but before then between my dad and my mom I've lost five other family members that were my aunts uncles and mm -hmm. um you know my grandma um it's been a hard couple of years but the thing is like people don't see that online I feel like the social media that we became a part of was not really like very hyper personal um, it was very much like, this is a topic that we're going to be talking about, books, but you won't know me beyond that. And, like, that makes, like, relationships difficult and it makes um, just your day-to-day -day life difficult. Like, I was doxxed when I moved to London, so I had to move into a different flat. It, there's so many different things that, like, were components of me leaving YouTube that um, I never shared online because, like... I was scared to. I was scared to be my true self like I used to be. Um, and it's it's a damn shame uh, because, like, 
I would love to share my journey into publishing, for example, mm -hmm. without a degree. Um, but um, whenever I see comments saying like, oh, when are you coming back to YouTube? I say like, I don't know. Um, I would love to be part of the community that once was, but I don't know if it still is. Um, what yeah. do you think, Christine, on that, by the way? Because I, um, I, I, have, Tasha. To, I have to say just um, for you two, I think like um, – Sasha, you grew up in this space, and then oh, Christine yeah. also grew up in this space. But she had a little bit. You had a Christine. You had a little more years under your belt, and you were able. You had, um, I think, like Sasha's ground was shifting all the time. But you had a bit more stability. And I don't know if that's true, but I'm. I I think both you guys had similar experiences, but also different experiences. And so, Christine, I'd love to hear, yeah, like how YouTube kind of changed for you. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got email listening to Sasha. <laughs> Can you repeat the question from like, what was the original question? <laughs> yeah. So um, th you guys were the first of your kind to go through this and um, to experience, you know, the shift from content creator to author. How did the YouTube space change for you okay i'm sorry now it's like it's okay talk, I'm, I'm like reliving like listening to sasha and then like thinking about how am i going to answer this question okay so i remember watching sasha get beat up online and thinking like <laughs> sorry i have to make fun of it be someone no, me too. I mean, Coping. like, that's how I cope with it too. But yeah. like listening to you talk about it and then like remembering it and knowing like, you know, being there for it and then knowing I had a book coming out soon. I was convinced yeah. it was going to be different because my book felt so personal that I was like, it would be really mean because yours was sci-fi. So I felt like it was easier for people to set you aside as not a person because that's what people yeah. do, especially young people. And our audiences were young. Like I can't hold it against anyone no. that's what people do when you're young like you you kind of separate the people you're watching you feel mm -hmm. like they're so in such a different world than you are that you're they're never gonna be seeing this or be affected by it well we see but everything the, the reality of it is we're in a very small community mm -hmm. and like you see everything it videos with like the meanest fucking titles about oh. my own book would come up on my homepage when I opened right? up YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why am I seeing this? I'd have to block, like, see, I don't want to see this. Also, because Google it your would username. Just... You would get so many, like. Even when you Google my name, there's still one negative ass review that comes up in yeah. like the first three things. And I'm like, can you not? <laughs> like, also, I have to say, this is not I my, loved Again But Better. Me. Like, Again But Better was like, <laughs> my like soul book for that year like it was such an incredible novel and even if you weren't the one who wrote it i would still have loved it but like thank it's you such a that's damn really shame. nice of you to say and i i like the thing is i know again but better is good and i know it is like, great. i love that fucking book <laughs> so it was like also the imposter syndrome and the idea that everyone hates you was such like a trigger for me because i felt like yep. like for so long like I feel like a lot of people on YouTube have this like childhood where you feel like nobody likes you all the time and that like yep. everything you are is not likable and annoying to everybody and then you get on YouTube and you find an audience you're like wow people like me now this is so cool like I, I you feel so loved and when you've never felt that kind of um camaraderie before yeah. And then it just like comes crashing back around. Like I just put out this thing that is like my heart and soul and mm. people hate it. So people yeah. hate me. That's what, that's it, what and, you feel. And all the logic kind of goes out the window. Cause I, again, yep. like I believed in myself so much. I knew, knew that I was putting out something that I loved and that I knew other people were going to love, but it doesn't matter in that moment because you see all these people like going out of their way to shit on you. Mm -hmm. So you feel, and it's not, I'm not talking about negative reviews. I'm talking about people who are like writing these actively hating on you <laughs> that actively are hateful. Yeah. And like, yeah. and 
a lot of times I know it's so people can grow their channel. People grew their channel off the backs of hating our books. And they it did. was just like, they did. it just, it hurt so much as being when you're that, when, as like looking at that community for so long as your yeah. safe space. And I, again, I want to reiterate, like whatever it's a, it's a piece of art that I've put out there. So obviously everyone's allowed to have whatever their opinion they want, but the author being a part of that community, like that whole mindset oh God, shift yeah. was so difficult. Also the author being the target of the conversation. Mm. What negative reviews um, that you see of authors who oh, yeah. are um, just offline, like you don't see them being discussed in their book reviews. Meanwhile, <laughs> people target us because they know our face and we the do thing have is, a special yeah. situation, but also like it's what ran me off of YouTube. That's part of what makes this hit so hard because everyone knew us. Like that's the yeah. thing. So it feels like it's not just about what you wrote. It's about you being the person who wrote it. And so many times when someone wrote something bad about mm -hmm. my book, it was because I wrote it. It was because Christine right. was in it too much. And that was just like, again, it, the it was so hard to like put two and together and I know it's because a lot of people again I've had to like go to a lot of therapy I had to go to therapy I couldn't sleep I couldn't like function I was having so many health issues and a lot of in therapy is talking about like how a lot of the time when people are coming at you and I'm not talking about again I'm not talking about like criticism of the book i'm talking about like coming at you with personal attacks because of the book yes. yeah it's because of like their own psyche what they're going through in their life a lot of times like when you see someone achieving a dream that you want to achieve and yes. you're young and you are like in a bad place like the snap reaction is to be cruel mm -hmm. and i think we've all been yeah. there like we've all yeah. been in that place mm -hmm. we've and all been there. you have to like file everything people say through that filter because so, it's like it's not about you it's like five percent about you and 95 percent about whatever they're going through yep it's um, very hard to like bring that to a place in your mind a where you sense can of like um solace calm yeah. down yeah um, <laughs> it was almost like it was almost like premeditated in a sense yeah, it was. because of no, it was. the attacks. I kind of want to move the conversation into, you know, going yes. into your second book or maybe Sasha writing Breaking Time. Mm -hmm. What now going through that experience of publishing your first one, what was the experience then writing a second book or your second series? Did you deal with imposter syndrome? No, um, I was very fully aware of myself okay. um, because like of the fact that um, it was all myself. Um, I, well, it was myself and Kate. Um, Kate, I feel like people don't really talk about their editors enough. Um, your editor is your best friend. Um, I was on FaceTime calls with Kate every single week throughout her editorial process because I needed her support, her help. Because I'm an author, yes. But when you write a book, there's the book, but also it has to be severely edited, um, streamlined, proofed, corrected. And having somebody there that is your best friend in the process is so vital and important. So My you editor, would say mm -hmm. that like she helped you through you know, any hesitation you might have had after that experience that you had online? Oh, yeah, she helped me. Yeah, no, she helped me and beyond with that. Um, mm -hmm. Also, my, uh, Joe Volpe, uh, my agent, she she encouraged me to keep on checking on because um, I felt like I was drowning. So, Christine, what was your mindset then going into writing your second book? So, going into my second book, there were a few things from my first book that I really felt like I didn't do that I should have done. And that's getting ahead of the review narrative was something because yeah. I saw a lot of authors that would post like positive reviews when they came out. And then I and I felt like I didn't want to influence anybody. But what happens if you don't like post the first review is that someone else gets to make the narrative around your book. So the first review to come out from like 
any influencer is going to be the first review mm -hmm. that everyone sees. And so when like I got like the positive Kirkus review and when I got like the positive book list review, I immediately was like, look, look, like I, I wasn't going to be like afraid to post that people liked the book, you know, because that helps people want to read it and anything that helps people want to read the book or like helps steer the narrative of the book and not let like some person who potentially wants to trash the book because a lot of people will go into books w intending to trash them if they want them to be bad hmm. we know that's the thing that does well on youtube yeah and i'm like just going getting like going into your second book you kind of had to build your armor around you so that you yes. know that experience wasn't so blind blinding uh, yeah and yeah i think christine talking about your positive reviews were a way for you to build up that armor. Yes, exactly. And I know when the book came out, I had John read all of the Amazon reviews and then he'd be like, okay, you can look. <laughs> he'd read them out loud to wait, me. With John, wait, you said John? Yeah, I was still with John when, when the book came out. Yeah, I mean, by the time Better Together came out, I wasn't looking at any of the YouTube videos. I was like, I'm done with that. I remember with Again But Better, you I would get tagged. You looked at YouTube videos, though, in the first time. I would get tagged. You get tagged in them. In oh, tweets. yeah, that's why I left YouTube. I cannot stand that because I would get tagged in would... so many negative reviews. Yeah, and I would think like, oh, is this person tagging me because they love the book? And then I would start it would and be like, oh. no, they're just tagging me. What the fuck? Don't tag me. Don't tag authors in it. I no, feel like don't so on tag Twitter, authors in your reviews. Please don't. This is a thing feelings. at the time that people would be like, you should watch the negative reviews because yep. that's criticism on how you're going to get better. If you no, think that the author not. hasn't heard the criticism already, you are mistaken. Also, like you um, will see it mm -hmm. over and over again. <laughs> also, do you not think that there's professionals that are editing yes. their novels? Um, there's oh. professional critiquers in the publishing sphere that actually looks at their books in a hypercritical manner. Um, and like, that's the thing that really frustrates me nowadays, like being on, cause I've been on all sides of the publishing spectrum. Now I've been a blogger, mm. I've been a author and I've been now a book marketer in publishing. I see the back end, and whenever, um, an author messages me saying, can we take down this negative review? I'm like, no, you can't, but you can't avoid it by not seeing mm -hmm. it. Have a group of people that will give you the positive critiques there's positive and negative critiques. The negative ones are focusing on you as a person. Um, I guess that's more like factor towards us um, because they think that they know us as people. They don't, um, but yeah. you know, it's okay. But, that's how like the structure goes when it comes to social media and us yeah. being on there for so long. But um, then there's positive critiques, like being like, I don't like these pros, or I think that this is like, kind of silly, but like, that doesn't offend me. I'm fine with critique. Oh, no. I'm just not yeah. fine with offensive comments. Yeah, In the offensive comments, even, you've seen them. The thing is, even when the book comes out, like you're talking about the editor beforehand, of course, gives you a lot of critique. But once the book comes out, mm -hmm. the main critiques that like you can learn and do better from, you will see it over and over again. You will realize it because like just you, by seeing it once, if it's if it's actually an accurate critique, you will like mull it over and like exactly. think about it for a very long time. But like people will say that same thing if it's actually a a yeah. constructive criticism, you'll see it pop mm -hmm. up. Yeah, you don't need to be like author, author, <laughs> look at this. Like, Katie, says, see it. Katie says um, con constructive criticism and bullying are two very different things. Yes. Katie yes. is like literally my soulmate. For the second book, I feel like people were less ready to be up in arms because it was like, you know, there was a lot going on to distract people who weren't like really dedicated. Because to you were publishing right in the middle of the pandemic. Yes. Hating what I was putting out. And I remember, like, it was so much less demoralizing. The negative, the one-star review that had come up on Amazon was that there was too much cursing and better together. I'm like, okay, like, that's a great negative review. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
stuff like that. So it was way less painful because I was prepared. And I think because there were less people like ready up in arms to come at me. Of course, I like stayed away from YouTube completely. So maybe there were people over there being mean, but I got to miss out on it. So that was so much less stressful. I was in such a... I was in a terrible headspace because I was like breaking up with John over and over again at that time. But like also in book in the book bubble, I was in a much better headspace. Oh my gosh, Fiona looks so funny. What is she wearing? <laughs> she She's a horse triceratops. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So um w- last question here. What advice would you tell your pre published you before your first book ca- came out? Um, I would have said, you're doing all right. Um, keep on writing what you want. Sorry, my dog. She's just licking Literally making out with me. (laughs) Um, I would say that, um, you publish a book and that is a feat upon itself. Um, and to keep on doing what you're doing, but write for yourself, not for others. Christine? Okay, um, my things feel more strategic here, but I <laughs> I'm so inspirational. <laughs> um, well, like, obviously, the better together me, I would tell me to, like, write the characters that I want to write and not feel pressured to be like, they are so different from you, look at me, go. Like, that sort of, like, I can write characters that aren't like me, sort of proving a point sort of thing. That's what I was writing the book for, to prove a point at the time is what I felt like. Not the whole thing, but like the characters. I formulated them to be very different on purpose. And then like, Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy the book as much because I didn't get to like delve into my like stuff that I really am passionate about as much, just as like side things to their character because I was going in like these really different Mm -hmm. directions. Anyway um so that's obviously that getting ahead of the, like the book narrative is something that i i just want to i wanted to tell myself before again but better like don't be afraid when people like your book to share that people liked the book you yeah. know i was like f- afraid of coming off like look at me but like you have a book that you spent so much time on and if someone <laughs> likes it it's okay to like be like look someone liked it i did something uh, <laughs> I was afraid to ask for anything and put my input in on the second book. Like I was, this is my first time being on a solid deadline, working with a publishing company the whole time. So if I needed more time, I didn't think I could ask for it. And so my YouTube channel started to suffer and I would tell myself not to be afraid to ask for the time I needed because the YouTube channel was like an integral part to what the publishing company was using to promote the book. And if I, and so I, again, I went through all these phases where I had to step away from YouTube and I mm-hmm. wish I didn't have to, because as I love writing and I so much, but I also love YouTube. And now YouTube has become this struggle bus because mm-hmm. the, you know, the platform starts to hate you. If you, the more you take breaks and come back and like you. the more niche stuff you put up, like you can't put up your niche stuff anymore in order to get yeah. YouTube to like you again, you have to like follow everything that's trending and I'm it's just not authentic. doing that. Hmm. yeah um yeah. um so i would ask for the time i need to be able to keep up both things at once <laughs> yeah also christine one thing that you um that you said that really resonated with me is that i wrote my first two books without any character that i related to um oh, yeah. genuinely did not relate to any of them oh, okay. um and i mean gilly yeah like murderous redhead but like i'm that's not really me she's 14 years old Um, but when I finally read a book that had a character who had so many of my personality traits, my flaws, my animals, um, you know, um, I was damned because of that. Um, because they're like, oh, you're just writing about yourself. And I'm like, you know what? Yes, I am. Yes. It's because you got, again, like just reiterating, you guys have had a very different experience than most debut authors ever had and because people had such access to you guys and had grown up with you for Mm -hmm. years they knew you they knew a version of you that you that you wanted the world to know and with that um like Sasha in breaking time like you were able you know to then I think give a part of yourself to those characters Mm -hmm. um 
Uh, but I think I think the first book was a good way for you to maybe protect that piece of yourself. But for Christine, she gave so many so personal much. pieces of herself mm-hmm. to characters, and people have no people know Christine. People know you, Sasha, and so to read something that you know. Um, is so personal and you also know the, that person it's a very different experience than most yes. people reading that a debut sense. author um yeah have 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 had and um um I'm just yeah. I'm so proud of you guys for being able to give that part of yourself and for you know living also, through the, Tasha yeah. uh, can I just say uh Tasha's been the biggest campaigner for both of our novels both of our careers and she's been the bestest friend that I bet both of us have ever had so Tasha she's wonderful you get a (laughs) I just wanted to add here so my experience writing my debut novel and then seeing people be like there's too much of you in this novel was really frustrating because of course like Mm -hmm. the the idea that the things that people loved about you that's why they followed your channel and if they've seen in a book they're like Mm -hmm. oh this is not allowed is it doesn't connect it's illogical but every author (laughs) Every author has in their a debut bit of themselves novel, in their own novel. Has yeah. themselves in it, and yeah. you just don't know them. And I went back and reread a lot of debut authors' novels with a completely different perspective, and it was so interesting. Yep. And I had so much fun because I love getting to see these bits and pieces of that person that they're not sharing with us online, but you can see it through their writing. You can see yep. their pain and their, their struggles story. and mm-hmm. their quirks and different bits of their story that you didn't realize mm-hmm. were there until you wrote your own novel, you know, and yep. saw how it kind of works and it, it does the shift different perspective. the way you read. Um, and I, I now it sh- it's shifted the, c- completely the way I read. I will see bits and pieces of the authors in lots of different ways and theorize lots of different things that like could have inspired it. And I love that. Like the, it, it's all in the way you look at it too. Exactly. I, I don't know why that would be considered something bad because the author's writing something about it because they know so much about it. They know and, their story. Yes. <laughs> like, like if, Whenever I want to write a book, like I'm obviously going to write about a plus size character because mm-hmm. not a lot of people have that experience. And not a lot no. of people have yeah. the experiences that mm-hmm. every person in their own gets to experience and how unique that is yeah. to them. And I think it's amazing that you guys have been like Sasha has four books under her belt. Christine, she's got three, four. Uh, and Christine, I thought you had four. I'm working on she's a She's working on the fourth. I've, Oh, and spicy. You guys have done so well. I'm so proud of you and this journey. And I'm so excited we got to talk about it on Thank this you. episode today. I'm sure there's more that we could even explain or even, you know, our life after publishing, what how that has been. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up. Sasha, you have your new book out. Give Tell us about it. Uh, wait, let me grab it really quick. Okay. Before she grabs, I just want to say, like, thank you to every single person who has picked up one of my books or one of Sasha's books and been supportive online in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. It's meant so much to us. And, of course, we're talking about the traumatic aspects of it right now because, of course, those are obviously, like, the parts of it that are harder to share and... Uh, but we are so, so grateful for every Beyond. single person that's ever shared, mm-hmm. that's ever been positive, that's ever sent us a message, that's ever picked up the book mm-hmm. and um, written a positive review. Positivity is underwritten in shape or form. Um, and underdescribed in our sphere. And I feel like it's okay to be positive. It's okay to be loving. And um, with this, what we do, Christine, you and I, with our books, we love every single moment of it. Yes, there might be some hard moments, but it's the high points that we actually think about. Anyways, there's Fracturing Fate. Hi. <laughs> Fracturing Fate by Sasha Osberg. Um, also, Go like, yes, everybody thinks fate. that I look like um, the main character on this cover. And one of the fun fact, they modeled this uh, book character. I was going to say. After um, some photos I took in um, Iceland. In your prom dress. In my prom dress. Um, but I have to say... These books are my heart and soul. So are seen as the Nexus, but these books are everything to me. And it wouldn't be everything to me if it wasn't for the amazing people who backed me. Honestly, now when I write a review or review anything, I think about the person who wrote it watching it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
and try to word everything in a respectful way that's yeah. not cutting. Because uh, I never want to make anybody feel like <clears throat> the way that we have felt in the past. Yeah. <laughs> it's just shitty for your mm -hmm. mental health. I think when it comes to books, we have to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, and also just understand that they're all babies. These are my babies. And also, the spines are so stunning together. Very stunning. <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Anyways, I'm going to dip off your uh, wonderful podcast, but I have to say thank you guys so much for having me on. Sasha, where can we find you online before you leave? Uh, um, I have uh, seven days left until I get to have access to my YouTube channel again. So <laughs> what YouTube? about Instagram? A book utopia. Um, Instagram, Sasha Allsberg. Um, A-L-S-B-E-R-G. Um, and then I have tiktok that i don't use but if you want to see me active go on to at joffy books on all social media platforms yes. thank you sasha my nine to five is here. like my nine to life so yeah. and i love i love what i do at my nine to five and really quick note um i know it seems like a backtrack for some people to think that you can go to working from yourself for yourself to working for a company but find the right company and it will make you soar oh yeah I can't wait for I'm 10 so o'clock from the morning call tomorrow. <laughs> that you're at a job that you really love. And I am very grateful for this to do all these amazing things. Yeah. And also for your guys' support. So I love you guys. And I guess um, I'm going to be heading off. I'm going to go to bed right away. Okay. Anyways, I'm so proud of you guys. Thank you, and Sasha. Thank you for having me on. I'm going to go to bed, but I love you. Mwah. Love you. Thanks love for you. sharing with Bye. us. Bye. 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 Well, we are going to move into what right now. Christine, what have you been reading? I started Swordcatcher by Cassandra Clare, and I'm so excited. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's her new adult novel, and it's coming out in October. And I got the arc, and I'm just so thrilled to be in a new Cassie book and a new mm -hmm. Cassie world and sink my teeth into new Cassie characters. And I'm debating, like, I might start vlogging it because I feel like I, I'll probably be reading it over a long period of time because it's enormous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I don't want to, like, forget any of the details. And um, it might be a fun vlog. So maybe yes. I'll start doing that. What about you? What are you reading? I have been listening to Queen of Myth and Monsters. It's the second book in Scarlet, Scarlet St. Clair's like vampire series. And um, it is a quick read, but it's it's very it's it's good. It's not as good as um, from from Blood and Ash, in my opinion, but it's in that like same realm kind of. It's um, it's spicy. Like literally every other chapter there's a sex scene. <laughs> um I like it. And I also have, I started Shipwrecked by Olivia Dade. And she's the one who did, spoiler alert, like the, the plus size romance yeah. novels. And um, this one follows uh, two actors um, who are both plus size. So like we, uh, so the, the guy is also plus. And, um, okay. and they were cast cool. in the like Game of Thrones-esque um oh TV yeah, show. yeah yeah so yeah so all the books feed into each other because all, all the the characters are from it's like spoiler alert and then the second one i don't remember what it's oh um one true pairing one of those uh and then we have shipwrecked and so it's all in like the same um universe yeah what have you been listening to? nice I honestly have been listening to Olivia Rodrigo's oh, yeah. song over and over again, yeah. Bad Idea, right? Me and too. I haven't been listening to much else except for audiobook. Oh, I've been re-listening to A Court of Silver Flames through the graphic audio, oh, yeah. full cast version of it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, okay? I want to get them as a sponsor because I feel like it's so relevant to our podcast mm -hmm. and... I graphic audio if you want to sponsor us I'd be happy to talk about you for weeks on end um I also I have the Court of Mist and Fury one now because I love the Silver Flames one so much but it's not as good so if you're gonna buy one it's $15 for like the first part and they're they haven't put out the second part of Silver Flames yet I have an hour left and I'm like not listening because I don't want to finish it <laughs> how could they only do part one and part two 
they're gonna do part two i guess like they're probably still producing it so it has like music and sounds and like mm. when the sex scenes are happening there's like panting <gasps> like the way they say the lines are like they're having they're you know they're with each other and oh my god i was listening to this while i was doing the dishes out loud and there's a window that leads oh, right shit. to the walkway you're listening to uh, porn <laughs> And and it sounds like I was listening to porn. I was freaking out because my hands were like covered in like stuff from the sink. And I was like, no, stop. Stop talking. Someone's going to walk by. Oh, Lord. I'm just imagining the like the blowjob she keeps. <laughs> it literally. OK, it wasn't that scene. It was the scene where like um, before the blowjob, like they're making out heavy, though. And I think he has his. Oh, uh, doesn't maybe it is the blowjob that's i can't remember anymore because they're they come back to back those scenes like the next day is the blowjob <laughs> um, oh but that's yeah. exciting no the blowjob's <laughs> iconic <laughs> um i've been listening to beyonce's set list because i'm going to her show on the first um I'm not the biggest beyonce fan so i don't know a lot of her songs but i'm going for my best friend heather and um so yeah i just been listening to them so i actually I sh- like shine i know i know renaissance like that's my favorite album but like all of her old stuff i don't know very well wait you don't know like the halo album sasha fierce it's such a good album i don't know like a lot of the, i know like the pop a diva ones. is a female version of a hustler like the single ladies album no is i so literally never good. listened to them Oh my God! Halo is on that album. I know Halo. I if know the I popular were songs. A boy, like ever, it's like hit after hit after hit. Sasha Fierce. I was obsessed with that album. Um, but yeah, Beyonce's performance level is just so high mm-hmm. that it doesn't really matter if you know the songs. You'll exactly. like them after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just. I'm gonna have fun. Yeah. Yeah. I like. Her performance at was it like Coachella, Beachella was yes. just so, so amazing, and I didn't. That's Renaissance, right? That a lot of no, those that songs? was like a medley of all of her stuff. Renaissance came out like last year. Oh, okay. I'm talking. I'm thinking Lemonade. Lemonade. Sorry, Lemonade. Yeah, Lemonade. That a lot of that was Lemonade era, and I didn't know that era as well. But watching her do those, the performance made me so much more excited about lemonade and then i went back and listened to the whole album so good stuff man good stuff uh all right shall we move into mary kiss close yes i can never find the audio anymore this one's yours it is. Okay. Mary Kisscliff. E.T. Star-Lord. Gamora. Why did you pick one character who was not in Guardians, but you picked two that were? Because at first I was just going to do aliens, but then I was like, I don't know any aliens. <laughs> you could have picked, like, Spock from um, Oh. Star I'd Trek. block out Star Trek because I feel like not connected to it at all. Also, there's Star Wars. I don't feel connected to that at you all do either. Bob, I guess. What is his name? <laughs> Katie, I dare you not to cliff you. <laughs> okay, um, I am going to marry. Wait. I... <laughs> Um, I'm going to marry Star-Lord because he seems like fun. <laughs> uh, really, I'm not going to fucking kiss E.T. I'm going to kiss Gamora. She's fucking hot. I see that my, my inner monologue was like, oh, maybe I will marry Gamora, but she's like way too fierce. She's a little cutting. She's yeah. a little cutting for me. I don't think I could handle it, honestly. Um, yeah. I need someone a little softer, like Star Lord. Star Lord, yeah. I'm sorry, E.T., but I'm gonna cliff you. But hopefully, your little friend will come along on the bike and will capture you in his his basket. Your little friend. Well, he can fly. Catch he made the bike me. fly. I know. E.T. made the bike fly. Yeah, he's fine. I'll E.T. go bring home. A, bring a bike to catch him from the fall. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. E.T. scared the bejesus out of me as a child. Same. I, I hated so that afraid. movie. I did too. Oh my God. Wait, how come we haven't connected on hating that movie? I was so afraid of it. I was terrified. I like my parents watched it like three times and I remember hiding behind like the kitchen table, (laughs) even when like the THX thing went like, whoa, and I would just be so terrified. (laughs) E.T. was so scary. It was like a horror movie for me. And everyone loved it and, like, loved E.T. And I was like, that is a monster that I'm scared is going to be in my closet every time I turn off the lights. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to cliff E.T. and kiss Gamora and marry Star-Lord as well. All right. We're going to move on to Akamath. Now, because I apparently can't count... um. <laughs> I thought we were reading chapters 14 and 15 this week, but in reality, it was 13, 14, and then we read 15 because I thought we were reading up to chapter 15. It was a lot. Let me just tell you. It was a lot. So we're going to do our best to cover it all. I read it all twice, but I took barely any notes. Uh, so hopefully it goes well. I, but I, I have thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts, so I'm excited. Are you notes at the very end of it? It's okay. I read it twice. I feel confident. Let's do this. All right, Natasha, do you want to walk us through 13, 14 as much as you can? And I'll try to yes. tackle the enormous lump of 15, an hour long uh-huh. chapter. I have the most notes for this. Um, <laughs> by the way, I have bronchitis, so my voice might sound a little different. Yeah, if you need help, just flag me in. Okay. <sighs> okay. Uh, so we wake up. Oh, that's right. So favor wakes up. She's... Wake up in the morning. Oh, in the Sorry. Morning. Uh, she just got rescued by Moore, um, and she yes. wakes up, and she's a little disoriented. And we're f- but free though, we're free. <laughs> yes, but she's with Reese after Tamlin locked her in the house, and she looks up and like Re- Reese's face is like angry. He's just like just like blazing like, like staring, ruminating yes. on I think Tamlin. Tamlin, how much he just wants to kill him hates him and yeah. then when he knows that she's awake his face then relaxes into relief <laughs> um, he blinks and it disappears uh, yes my love she is fine um <laughs> my love uh okay so we get a little like uh explanation of why he couldn't take her out of the house because if he took her out of the house then it would have started an internal war between the two courts and we don't want that so that's why more had to get her um and then like at first favor is just dealing with this she's like oh my god like i don't want to go back but wait like should i go back i don't really know and then reese and like assures her that she can stay for as for 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 for, with him for as long however long she wants and that could be forever um and she, he's like, well, I do want you to work for me, so, like, maybe this could be a good thing, but, like, I also owe you, so, like, if we work this out, I will definitely shelter and clothe you and feed you. Um, but she, this whole time, she's just like, wait, should I go back? Will, like, Tamlin heal himself? Like, will, like, or does he just not know me? And I love that, like, the realization she comes through, like, with all three chapters here about Tamlin. It was pretty quick. Um, but that was... I think, Kristen, you can talk about that. Um, yeah. So, Rhysian's going to leave. And she's like, wait, no, don't leave me. Can I come with you? And it was like another, it was another juxtaposition of what she dealt echo. with with Tamlin. And, yeah. of course, Rhysian, there's a lot writing on, on, on her going with him. Like, it's not just protecting her. It's his entire... Um, like court safety court, yeah. is in her yeah. hands because if she goes with him, she can't tell anyone. She has to lie to everyone she has ever known or who she's friends with about what she sees. And he, he, his stakes are There's a lot no higher than back. Tamlin's. Yeah. What? 
there's no going back he says basically like you you can't go back to what you, you were before this like doesn't yeah. he say you can't go yeah you can't go back to tamlin if you come with me he says it but then he also says like uh like if you were to ever see like you have to if you were to ever see your friends again you would have to lie to them lie yeah yeah, yeah. but i think he says you can't go back to that court after this he says you can't go back right yeah, he says something like, you can't go back after this. If you come with me, there's no going back. And she decides then and there that she's not going back. Yeah. Um, we also kind of get, like, a run-through of what her powers could be from. Like, she has darkness, which could be from him. Um, she doesn't have wings, and she's not going to get wings because she's not Illyrian. Um, da, da, da. Uh, but that she could from Tamlin because of his shape-shifting powers. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Doesn't she get wings? <laughs> Yeah, she does. She she has shapeshifter powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, the ice is from the winter court, and wind is from day court, and winnowing belongs to everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah. So she makes that choice, and uh, he winnows her into the city of Valaris, which is the city of starlight, and mm -hmm. um, sunlight greets and she her. She can't believe. That there is a city. She says, if I'm going to a city, it's going to be ruins from Aramantha. Mm -hmm. She doesn't realize that he's been guarding it. And at first, she's very upset. Yeah. Because these people got to be guarded, but you couldn't guard everyone else. Mm -hmm. and it's to hard to like come himself. to that conclusion. Yeah. You know? It's very much like Wakanda yeah. in that way. Yes. Where, yes. like they would never like she even asked him at one point like why wouldn't you take anyone in to to shelter them or there's like refugees who need help and um but the city has been uh warded and shielded for 5000 years um mm -hmm. which is a very long time um yep. uh, but she gets winnowed into his ta the townhouse um and it's yes. very different from where she was with him cuz it's very small warm wood panels like velvet furniture everything was has been worn in and loved and mm -hmm. uh in chapter 14 he tells so Rhysand tells Feyre that no one can winnow in and out of the house except for him and more and that no one can no one is allowed to to allow anyone inside except him and now Feyre like he's already given her that um power or just just amazing but uh yeah. cassie and, and asriel but we didn't know we don't know that they're them yet are like pounding at the door and just being their funny fun selves um <laughs> and they're like let me in and then we hear um armin wait amrin yeah. i amrin. was about to say armin <laughs> i know i called her armin amrin we kind of get a wind of her being like fifteen thousand years old <laughs> Yeah, I love that they call her a tiny ancient one too, which is so cute. Fifteen thousand. <laughs> you imagine? That's a ridiculous number. <laughs> um, uh, and so also, did I say say this? Vlars's walls haven't been breached in five thousand years, right? I said yes. that. Yes. Um, and that okay. So they want to come inside, and then he's like, "Well, do you want to meet them now?" And she's like, "No, I want to go upstairs and take a nap." And he like kind of looks a little disappointed at that. Um. Uh, and then you know she's what asking. Sh oh, sorry. What? I was gonna say I'm pretty sure that five thousand years lines up with Crescent City. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. So she goes upstairs, and the two like what are their names? The two like servant people, or oh the... yeah, it's like Cressida from Hunger Games. It's like the two helpers that we like never really know, but they're there all mm -hmm. the time. They have and weird they're like, names. They're like, yeah, Rhysand likes to keep things casual. <laughs> She's like, why aren't they addressing him in like a certain way? Um, yeah. So it's just, it's just fun because Rhysand literally is this chill. <laughs> Rhysand is so chill. But it's basically like, I, that when, he, when we first met these characters, when I first read it, I was like, wow, this is the Cullen family. Like literally, like we have more as Rosalie. We have like little... Um, Amrin as Alice and then like Asriel and it's just like it lines up so perfectly and it's just like a warm I, little family I was thinking him as like Taylor Swift squad because that was this was during like peak squad times <laughs> I was like it's Rysanne's squad <laughs> it's 
Um, and she asked him like how he kept. She asked the servants how like she kept uh, that he kept Valaris away from Amarantha. Um, and they're like, it's not our story to tell. I'm like, is there a story? There's a story. I don't remember. Um, uh, okay, chapter 15, <laughs> go. Okay, so then she takes a nap and she wakes up and Rice Sand is going to go into the city um, of Valaris. He has, I forget like what he has to do there, but she goes with him to Valaris. It's and- like a present. It's like a present for her to go or he's getting a present for someone. He's like getting yeah. something. Yeah. 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 So he takes into Valaris and it's beautiful. She's never been in a city before. It's only, she only heard about cities because most of them in the human world were destroyed. So she's out and about and she's at first really scared that people are going to be like ogling her and thanking her as the curse breaker. And she's stressed because she just doesn't want those social interactions. And she's amazed at how casual everyone is about just saying hi to Reese and not bothering her at all, you know, kind of just nodding and greeting him warmly. And it's not like being under the mountain at all. They all are very respectful of him and, like, like the helpers said, casual. Like, it's very mm-hmm. chill. And um, she talks a lot about, like, just how beautiful being in this environment is and how lively it is. And I got to say, it felt like being in Crescent City. She was describing all the different types of people and almost, like, felt like, mer people some of the fairies yeah. she was describing and um, i'm go ahead no because well she also like goes to explain the layout of valaris mm-hmm. um and i i just I, I there's a lot of renditions of it and it looks like little towns in switzerland and um but the way that there's a river running through it and then uh, which leads to a sea and then there's two mountain ranges that flank the city so there's one European. that has like jagged peaks to the north and the yes. other is alive and awake and they're red flat top mountains same stone as some of the townhouses um in the city and the middle peak which is the largest of the plateaus has holes and windows built into it yes um that the resands house of wind. That there, that's Resan's other home. So for for me, I was like the house of wind. Like that didn't even. So it's not really a house. It's just built into the it's the built mountain into I never, the fucking mountain. So I didn't this is know that. Okay, this is amazing to me because now that we've read Crescent City, I'm really thinking there's a gate under this mountain. Like you know how there's mm. gates and there's yes. like the heart gate and all these different gates. Like there obviously. Is a, I think there's a gate under this mountain, and I think when this was breached, it was breached by, like... Uh, uh, you're getting spoiled. We, can, we can't say things. No, I, I'm... I i do not know if this is a spoiler, because I, I don't think this isn't what happened. Is it a spoiler that there was a war 5,000 years ago? Um, we can't really talk about how the two books may or may not i don't know i don't know for sure i'm just theorizing okay i won't go into details but i think there's a gate to other worlds under the mountain because there's all these monsters like there's the monster in the library you know Mm -hmm. and when you read silver flames there's this draw of some monster in the library the house is living like Mm -hmm. there is some being in that is in this house that makes the magic happen it is sentient Mm -hmm. and it's somehow connected to the other realms and Mm -hmm. the more that now that i'm rereading silver flames like there's a cat like feeling in the library and there's this cat in crescent city and some of the characters in crescent city look like characters in this book Mm -hmm. and i feel like there's all this there must have been a time where like they all crossed Mm -hmm. um so we also explore like the rainbow of Valaris, which is the art central. Um, and that's where we see all the many different fae walking around. And I feel like Sarah's trying to paint it as like a very multicultural place because not a lot of the courts are like this. Um, I feel like it's like a safe place for people to come. Um, 
It gives very much like Guardians of the Galaxy vibes. I don't know, in my mind. Like that's like some of the characters look like that in my mind. Um, yes. Yeah, oh, we also believe- learned that um, Amran is the first in Rusan's command and Moore is the second. Yes, and she's like a woman, <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. they. Why would I put these two Illyrian bozos in first and second? <laughs> um, um, I don't know what leads to this. I can't remember, but favorite like for a minute thinks that it would be better if she just weren't alive, and then Reese hears this and starts to seethe, oh, and Feyre jumps out, yeah. into his mind, and yes. he's like, "What the so, heck?" Okay. Yeah, so she slips into Rysan's mind, and he's like, what did you do to get past my shield? Shields. And she's like, oh, no, I just slipped. And he's like, how many times have you slipped before? And she thinks about Lucian, and he's like, you were in Lucian's head? That would have been miserable. But then he talks mm-hmm. about what he is. He's a Demati, which, yeah. like, you can walk into other people's minds like you're walking into different rooms. And I, again, thought this was really fascinating, that he is the most powerful High Lord in, like, 5,000 years, right? He says mm-hmm. a very long time. And... Again, this is this is making me think that like he is not like he has some sort of history where his um oh my god, what is it ancestors were from different worlds. I think that they're like crossed with Haife and that's why he has all these powers that are different from everyone else. No one's as strong as Reese. No one even comes close. Mm-hmm. Like so I'm really interested and I feel like the following books we're going to start tackling how like these worlds intersect and I'm so excited to see why how so anyway her magic is so similar to his that his shields recognize it as him and just like let her slip right on in Uh, and in that moment she sees herself through his eyes and it's the first time she's really seeing how she's been physically affected by the stress of Tamlin and the way he's been treating her. Like, she's gaunt, she's lost weight, she's got purple bruises under her eyes. Like, she looks horrible. And it's really this reckoning moment with how she sees herself and how she sees her entire relationship with Tamlin. That's when I think she starts spiraling. It's really this reckoning moment about their relationship. And later on, when they're flying to the House of Wind, he's like share a thought with me and I'll share a thought with you. I'll make a deal. And she shares finally that she thinks she, she was so low and so starved for any sort of kindness in her Mm -hmm. life. She was so lonely that she fell in love with the first person to show her a shred of humanity, to show her a shred of love. And she thinks that subconsciously that Tamlin knew that she was at such a low point that he could give her anything and she would fall in love with him, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously. And he wanted to be that everything for someone. But after everything that she's gone through, she can't be someone's pet. And she, she realizes that she had such a narrow view of the world that she didn't even see all of the spring court. She has no idea what she was missing out on. And she was so isolated that she couldn't have perspective on anything. And she almost settled for being someone's pet for the rest of eternity. Like she sees all of it clearly suddenly. And it's a huge moment for her, I think in moving forward with Reese because Mm -hmm. uh she's realizing that what she had with tamlin maybe isn't as real as she thought it was it was the first (coughs) thing that she saw and reese shares with her too and i'm blanking on what he shares with her do you remember natasha it's about aramantha right is it i don't really remember yeah it's not as profound (laughs) which is why i'm Um, not remembering it before that time when um they were like on the roof of the townhouse she's like, oh yeah no, i'm not going up I, you can't mess up my hair my dress is gonna rip off she's me like, and yeah, mess up my hair rip off my entire dress because she's in this like midnight gown because she thinks it's going to be really formal because of all tamlin's gatherings were really formal yeah and uh he's like well there's only two ways you can either walk up the ten thousand steps, 10, steps. <laughs> 
or I can fly you up. And she's like, I'll take my luck with 10,000 steps. <laughs> she couldn't even walk up the hill of the city. <laughs> we know how hard those 10,000 steps are. He's like, I yes. really don't feel like walking up 10,000 steps. I just, uh, I posted my, my, my blue, um, like fey gown I made last year for the Rings of Power TV oh, yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, as I was reading this, I was like, oh my gosh, it's probably, that's what my gown looks like. <laughs> um, she also in the city shows her the art district and says that this is what Valaris is known for. And she kind of gets a glimpse of like all the art supplies and stuff and mm -hmm. the, like there's this i feel like tentative idea of what her life could be like here and the idea that maybe like she could get back to herself and think of herself as an artist she's like i've never even thought of myself as an artist before but like she's opening up to the idea that in some place like this where it's so I don't know, life is just so happy and cultural in this city and there's so many people and there's so much warmth and people who are supportive. Mm. It's opening up her mind in so many different ways. It's really nice. I end up reading a little bit into chapter 16, so I don't know where it ended. It ends like okay. when she gets there. It, like people are there and they're saying hi. Like he he owes her two more thoughts because she shared five thoughts. And then he's like, but we'll do that later because Cassian and Azriel are there. So that's where we end, I think. Yeah, so she meets them. She, she doesn't meet Amarin yet, right? No, yeah. They're about to all have their okay. meeting time. <laughs> I think the next chapter is like an hour long. It is. Maybe we should just do that chapter so you can really focus in. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, y'all, thank you so much for being here for this episode. It was a long one, but I think we got into some deeper topics, so that is why. <laughs> this is very yes. long. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being with us. We want to say, um, oh, my God, there was... Okay, we're we're going to go record Fangirl Tea Time. So if you are a patron, that is available to you. And if you want to become a patron, the link is in our show notes. So check out all of our different Patreon tiers. They, we are on Instagram at Those Working Fangirls and on all the social media outlets on YouTube. You could subscribe to the show and so you'll never miss an episode those youtube.com slash at those working fangirls if you haven't already we really appreciate you following the podcast for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss a po an episode over there either that really helps us out and we want to remind you that a twilight hot take episode is coming we haven't received any emails yet so we Maybe need we your one. twilight oh yeah oh yeah we got one email we need your twilight hot takes for the episode okay they don't have to be long but you can have as many as you want so think on them and email them to the, those working fangirls at gmail.com please we want your hot takes y'all we want your hot takes <laughs> um <laughs> We don't care if they're basic. We don't care if they're basic, okay? Shoot us what you've got. We're excited and we need them like via email because we don't want to like see them all right now and react to them yet. You know what I mean? We want to copy paste them into a doc and like react in person, you know? But mm -hmm. yeah, think of your hot takes, email them to us. And uh, yeah, the podcast is edited by Alex Polis and Jake Needham with music by Cole Jenkins and vocals by Heather Traska. We put out new episodes every Friday and we will say see you next week. Thank you guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Ha, 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 ha.